This week on the House of Static, world-renowned bass player for the Hollywood Vampires, The Cult, Ace Frehley, Ozzy Osbourne, his own band Owl, and so many more, in-demand LA musician, and my cousin, Chris Wise. How's it going? Welcome to another edition of the House of Static. As you know, I'm Bob Smith, the uh, static part of the thing, also known as the Static Dive. And of course, my uh, my co-host Kilo House. Kilo, say hi. Hi. <laughs> there you go. Kilo's in LA. I'm in New York. And uh, every episode we've had so far, most of them anyway, Kilo's had a guest there because you know he's in LA and I'm just in a small really? town in upstate New York. But this time uh, was uh, special for a whole bunch of reasons. One, because uh, I do have a guest here today, and also because of who that guest is. My cousin, Chris Y. So, Chris. Say hi. Hey, cuz. <laughs> there you Chris go. Chris Wise here. Hey. Right on. So, um, and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, as we often do, I'll, I'll give a little background on, on, you know, how I know Chris and what, what, who Chris is, what he does, and then, and we'll, we'll let, uh, Chris do the same, you know, talk a, a little bit about himself and, and what he's doing here. But uh, so Chris is a bass player, not just a bass player. He is a, a bass player extraordinaire, literally one of the top uh bass players in the industry uh, really uh, for about 25 years now it's, it's he's a, he's an in-demand session player live studio uh, live side live player studio player and uh been a member of some pretty big acts over the years and we'll get into that a little bit um but originally you know and he lives the funny thing is chris lives in la as yeah right right, <laughs> right? but uh he's back home for a little while to uh visit his mom who is downstairs with my mom <laughs> and that's right and uh, we're gonna, you know, so he came in to say hi. Um, so anyway, so Chris, why don't you, uh, you know, say hello, tell us uh, a little bit about uh, about yourself. Uh, like you said, I'm a bassist, um, singer songwriter. Uh, when I moved to Los Angeles, I started joining a lot of different bands. Um, but my background from here, right. uh, is is me being a teenager playing bass um guys come to mind like steve harris and billy sheehan right. i remember a, a local band called triffid that we all just loved they were uh, they're yeah. they kind of in the van halen vein yeah. and um <clears throat> yeah we love them so in, in in the late 80s when i was in high school um uh, the battle of the bands were such a huge yeah, sure. uh, really competitive sort of source for Saratoga us winners. Yeah, yeah. Saratoga winners yeah. was a big thing. Um, I mean, folks should know actually where we're from, right? So uh, I always say I'm New York, I am, but it's upstate New York and it's up, uh, Chris is from the Albany area, uh, from not Colony, Clifton Park. Right? Yeah, it's kind so, of, uh, yeah, technically Saratoga County. Right, right. And uh, my mom and dad met in, uh, Manhattan and they were Irish immigrants and they we lived in Queens and Manhattan uh, they did originally and right. then I was born in Queens and then they moved uh, upstate to the kind of capital district area right and um, that was my sort of real formative high school years and things that developed us guys that uh, well and that I that's a strong thing the battle of the band sure right? yeah yeah and I, I think that um I you know I I think that Chris is, uh, is uh, cut uh, sell himself short a little bit on those teen years because in those teen years I mean that we're all music I, I'm obviously a musician I was in, in, in that time I was more of like a, like a hippie band I still am a hippie <laughs> a hippie band Chris is a rocker we had like, I think we had one gig time. One time we played a gig together uh, at so, QE2, yeah. 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 But that was like in our 20s. QE2 is a great memory. Oh, too. yeah, yeah. You know, it was like the alternative. Exactly. Place, yeah. But Chris was the, you know, he was the bass player in the area. And and still to this day, I mean, friends of mine up here still know Chris Wise very well and who he is as from his reputation at home and his reputation in L.A. And you even were in, uh, was it Guitar Player or Guitar World magazine? Which one? Uh, I, I, the names changed. It was guitar player right. when I was 17. 17 yeah. yeah. And that was kind of interesting uh, for a young guy. And then I think around 2021, it was guitar for the practicing musician. Right on. And mm -hmm. so there was like those write ups for uh, kind of the extreme players. I mean, I remember seeing 
uh, Ingve in those columns and Richie Kotzen and like Steve Vai. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, like that, that was kind of at the time that was like one of those really big spotlight features you could get if you, sure. were, you were like kind of an extreme player. It was know? a big deal, man. I remember, um, cause Chris and I are the same age, uh, just a few months apart. And, um, I remember about that time I was not a virtuoso as Chris <laughs> was, <clears throat> I was, a, I just started playing guitar when I was like 16. And, uh, I remember going to your house and you're like, yeah, you know, in very much the same kind of mellow tone that he, that Chris always has. He's like, yeah. So I, uh, got in this magazine here, you know, <laughs> 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 it's totally true. That's funny. And there's, there's my cousin with the eighties hair and his bass. And it's yeah. like, it was crazy. But Colin, oh, Chris wise, it was, yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, a really cool kind of, uh, somewhere between, I guess, uh, Def Leppard, Rick Savage, and Bon Jovi. Yeah. Term. I, I was really, really nice. It's, it's funny he says Def Leppard because I actually was a one-handed drummer myself. So if it wasn't for Def Leppard, like, I never would have even thought to be a drummer. So I wouldn't even be doing any of this right now. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. What an inspiration he is. That's right. great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Kilo is actually, uh, although I'm a hippie, Kilo is now an EDM producer. He's uh, He was in a metal band for years. He was a, dr a drummer in a metal band. And you used to do the, um, you played I, the in the hats with one hand, right? I would have like the the hi-hat in the, the normal position and then the the um, other stick would come through my pinky and indent or pinky ring finger. So I could hit the snare over here. So it was like, yeah. Very, in my opinion, easier than playing with two hands because you only have to control one motion. So I thought it was easy. I, I've but, seen video of it. It's the craziest thing. I mean, that's really, really, that's that's really innovative like this. thinking. Yeah, I've, yeah. I, I've seen people do tricks and stuff, but when you make it your, your that's the way you base play. of how you play, that's really impressive. Yeah. Right. Yeah, cool. Well, um, Rick Savage, or no, Rick Allen, um, just did an interview recently with someone and it was pretty in depth. Yeah, Def Leppard drummer. Rick Allen. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Like yeah. uh, mm -hmm. that was really inspiring because what what a story. So if you haven't seen that, pretty, pretty good. Yeah, interview. I'll definitely yeah. check that out. Yeah, Everybody that's, that's watching needs to check that out. I'm sure it's an amazing interview. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, so we have a cool background. I think I, I think when the uh technology came on, everything changed, of course, with the social media, but Essentially, what we had was this hands on type of lifestyle where, like, I remember my bands. I had a band called East Wall. I had a band called Mr. Strange. I still have a Mr. Strange. Yeah, here yeah, I found really. it in, like in my studio. We had, a, we had a, you know, um, a great run at, a, at the local vibe. There's like bogeys and QE2 you mentioned yeah. and countless others, uh, you know. Saratoga Winters was like a home base and all that. So. You know, it's funny. I was just talking to Sarah about that scene a couple of days ago, and I was going through all this. I was telling her stories about playing at Bogies, playing at Ico's was a, a kind of hippie joint in Saratoga, mm -hmm. and a Bogies was a real cool rock club in in Albany. They had they had metal, they had punk, they had you know jam bands and everything. So Chris played there, and I played there, and a whole bunch everybody played there. Uh, QE two was another one like that. It was sort of like rock club, dance club, weird club, and then they shut down. It was sort of Albany's, Albany's CBGB, I, I think. I always right. thought QE2 well, was that, you know? Remember the girl's name at the QE2, Char, right? Right, yeah. yeah okay, so right. Oh, Char was considered sort of the sister to CBGBs, and she was the one that got, uh, got my band into CBGBs, and I remember thinking how cool that was of her. Yeah. And so a lot of the bands would come from New York City on the way up to Canada, they'd always hit this area because mm -hmm. we had like uh several places to play and uh yeah that was the that was the scene but the thing was we would go out to like an arena or saratoga winners and flyer every car so if you pull out to your car there oh, was yeah. like you know east wall mr strange yeah. or whatever bands we were playing with on that too and we would just pack these clubs like we were uh you know we well, mentioned those national bands. acts you yeah. used to i mean the reason Chris brought up the the, the battle of ants is because they won them all. Like East Wall was East yeah. Wall was a big <laughs> East Wall was a big deal. Yeah, and it's it's Mr. Strange. Yeah, I didn't deal. even think about. I was just thinking more about yeah, but true. We that was kind of how we sort of became king of the scene for that rock genre we were in. Yeah. I mean, um, and well, it was a lot down. of fun. And bands wear out, and times change. And I had a couple five year runs with bands, and then 
uh, then I moved off to Los Angeles. I knew I had opportunities there and uh, the scene was changing. Like we created the scene here mm -hmm. and we took advantage of the fact that there was a crowd that wanted rock and roll entertaining music, you know? Um, and when those bands died down, everything started changing. You know, the, the whole uh, area here became probably because of the um, sign of the times with music and everything. There was just, you know, Seattle took over and then sort of the pop really started to pick up and the hip hop mm -hmm. then. And, um, LA was what I needed to do next. Right on. Oh, and I remember that, that I mentioned that QE2 gig. Uh, the reason it sticks in my mind, well, one is because it's like I said, the only time we actually played a gig. At the <laughs> like, I, I don't remember. There were like three or four bands on the bill and my band was on, which was a very strange, uh, if you've ever heard my band Shoe, it's a, you know, kind of a ska slash jam band, hippie, weird jazz jam thing. Completely different than, <laughs> than Mr. Strange. I like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. But it was great. It was a great gig. But anyway, the reason I, I remember that is because afterwards, Chris and I went out and uh, we went we went to Bogies actually and had a pint of Guinness and hung out a bit. And I think that's when you were telling me, you're like, I'm, I think I'm going out to L.A. Because you went pretty soon. It was in the mid 90s when you went out. Yeah. There, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So and L.A. is when it, I mean, that's, you know, that's when things all happen. Right. You got hooked up with Bob Rock. It's about, yeah. about 95, 96. I went out there and I had some friends and bands and things like that and their opportunities and such. Uh, I became, a you know, I, I had like 40 students here a week in uh, there's a place called Drome Sound and yeah. I, I did private lessons okay. and all that. And, uh, and then I went to LA, I just lucked out and I instantly got a teaching job because that's I had such great. experience here. And that's how I started meeting everyone. I was in the music stores, a place called Spitzer's Valley Arts before your time. Um, yeah. And it was up on Laurel and Victory. And oh, yeah. I live by Victory. Okay, so. cool. Yeah, I, I used to go there every day and teach several people. And then as a result, I started meeting musicians and they said, you got to see this band. Like, you got to go see this one and that one. And as a as sort of dumb luck, I lived next door to the guy that was playing in Steve Vai. And the, this guy, Chris Pittman, is a good friend of mine for years happened to be the sound man for Tool. And the Tool guys would come over and be like, who's that guy in the guest house in the back? You hear him bowing away. I was really getting deeper and deeper into upright bass, bowing and classical and trying to get all my bass guitar madness onto the upright, mm -hmm. which is very challenging in that world. Uh, so, but I was hammering away at it and they're like, who is that guy next door? Because Paul Demore left Tool and he was starting a band called Lusk with Chris Pittman, who ended up in Guns N' Roses for like 20 years. Um, so that was just like this lucky thing. I literally, my next door neighbor was my first break. Right. And they bought me my first electric upright bass. So suddenly now um, I was able to put a little flanger and wah-wah and distortion on my bass, which I was never really able to do only in a low volume setting. You right. know, now I was able to keep up with the, the Marshall, but that particular band called Lusk, uh, had a harpist, like this kind of harp, classical oh, nice. harp. Oh, wow. I mostly, I think, all upright, and half of the set was bow. And it was like a psychedelic, uh, psychedelic kind of Beatles bowie awesome. tip. And it wasn't like Tool at all. And uh, that was kind of my first bigger exposure. Some red tape with the label. And next thing you know, I was auditioning for Tal Bachman which is randy bachman's son yeah and bachman turner overdrive guess who yeah, yeah so he's, he's a legendary uh name in in canada especially so i went to audition and i got the audition and suddenly i was flying out to maui to do the album with bob rock and that that those were the first beginnings for me i mean even though i'm much more of a i would say uh leaning towards a heavier hard rock tip at times i mean i'm i i, I could do uh at that point, I was open to anything, and Tal is very good classic, like rock to pop. And um, well, that was a and he had a hit. I mean, that big was hit. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing is that um, you know there 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 are pieces of this I'll fill in that you know that, that, that like for instance Bob Rock is if if you don't know is one of the most really the biggest rock and roll record producers ever, and, and especially rock uh you know he's Bob rock for a reason yeah i mean he's done like the black album. record from metallica metallica def leppard uh just t tons and tons of stuff the I mean, cult the and cult, then yeah. um uh motley crew and bon jovi yeah you don't get bigger than Bob quite rock, really. quite the big big um 
he's like the one that sent everyone over the top too. So it was yeah. a real treat to work with him because suddenly all my years of studio experience with like 10 guys on the board trying to do the mix and getting your little toe up there to get the, the reverb on that little <laughs> yeah. bit at the end of the song. Right. So it all came into play. I finally got to exercise it all with someone on the top. And I realized like, wow, this is, this is kind of, this is where I belong working on this level and working with this and this kind of like talent and artistic prowess. I was like, I was very comfortable because I felt like I did so much homework by the time I got there. I was ready to work with anybody, country, classical, jazz, but it was a great rock record. It was super well produced. Oh, yeah, it was that it was and that's what I was gonna say, like the, you know, I so back back a bit to that that story about how hanging out with Chris, having a beer, and then he's like, ah, I think we'll go to LA. I and mean, like what, a year or two later, he's on MTV. <laughs> like and that's yeah. I mean, that's the truth. I mean, I remember watching MTV like there's Chris, you know, he's, the, and I think you were playing he's the upright. in the video. Yeah, but you're, you're I, in there, and I think I'm you're on, playing the upright. I'm on all the, uh, it, you know, She's So High was the song, yeah. it was a big hit. And she's So High. I always high laugh high because, high. yeah, yeah. It, something that we, we played over and over for a while. It was a big hit, man. It was a big, a big late 90s hit. It really was. And for me, I was just, you know, kind of dressing up the songs with the, the kind of uh, musical, singer songwriter background i had even though i'm kind of into chops and right now i'm working on a solo album featuring maybe a little more bass centric uh stuff but it's still writing and, and well yeah so, i mean you're in chops but you're a very melodic style I yeah mean, you're very melodic player. if you can't walk away from a bass solo guitar solo uh drum solo and remember a couple themes i don't think you did a good job because the chops uh should only enhance that stuff, you know. You, you create the fireworks around those melodies and stuff, and then right. then people remember the melody. So same thing with the song. I, I I try to create excitement as opposed to play a lot of notes. Right. You know. Well, you know, it's a it's like a nobody would care that Jimi Hendrix burned his guitar if he wasn't first the greatest guitar player in the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like He played right. his ass off, and then yeah, sure, he do the fun stuff, and it and it brought you know got people excited. Yeah. But you know the notes in between, or those that's that's where it was. That if was he was a poor that. player, everyone would have left. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like they all got him. This is burning his guitar. Burning his guitar. <laughs> Thank God he burned it. Everyone's yeah. like, no, nope, okay, this guy's weird. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why is he just so, like that guitar? <laughs> so could we get a little bit more backstory to how you go from? where you start deciding you want to make music to being on MTV, right? We don't know the backstory to you being a musician. Where did you start? What was the first album you heard that made you want to be a guitar bass player or whatnot? You know, like where did it all begin for you as an artist? Well, there's, there's, there's some key highlights for me, probably like everyone else, you know, even though there's a hundred, things probably a year that influenced me once I really got right. inspired but um the initial thing for music was hearing that attitude and, and charisma of Elvis and the stomp which was a little different than the Beatles at the time Beatles had a lot of kind of you know uh of a different feel and for me for some reason Elvis was like that stomp at the rhythm section and the attitude and, and I think when I say stomp, it had a punch, yeah. you know? And so right. that was exciting. And I begged my parents for an Elvis record. And then I got this Christmas cover record. I remember I wasn't happy, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it was great to have Elvis. So that was kind of the first- I know our moms are both big Elvis fans. Yeah, too. Our, moms they were too. In New York City. yeah my... our, our moms are both from, uh, they're sisters and uh, they're from Ireland. So they came over to, my mom came over first, but then te I think Mary came over a year or two later. And they lived Something in like the, that, right? Yeah. And they lived in the city together. And used to go see Elvis movies three times a day. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, that uh, probably influenced how I felt about the music in the beginning and stuff. And there was a lot of excitement. I remember the day Elvis died. I was like eight, nine years old. But I mainly remember my mother's shot. Radio in the kitchen, get ready for school. Oh yeah, I remember watching the funeral procession, procession yeah. go down the street in, 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 with my mom. You know, because she was de devastated. Yeah, that was that was a really yeah. He was in eighty six or whatever it was. I saw a couple days ago. Yeah, yeah, right. Birthday. Yeah, his birthday was the eighth. Yeah, remember. so that was that was kind of a, a thing. Like as a, a very young child, being impressed, and then of course for me, uh, one of the biggest ones was Kiss and sort of the comic books. Yeah. And, the oh, yeah. development again of like the fire on the guitar 
it went like you know that that was kiss right. in May. it was like they had all these crazy uh kind of heavy songs when we were kids almost yeah. more sabbath zeppelin i would compare them to and it was more uh about women and and you know partying and stuff like that but the music had a heavy vibe then everyone wanted to be kiss and i dressed up like kiss and <laughs> yeah. halloween and we had fake guitars and i had dressed up like gene simmons and had ketchup in my mouth yeah. for this fake concert it was crazy stuff and it was horrible awesome. all over my clothes <laughs> uh my memory of you as a kid, right, as what, as far as what you were into, was uh, Kiss, Maiden, yeah. and and the Six Million Dollar Man. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, what Elon Musk has got us headed there, you know. Uh, <laughs> there you go. But at the end of the day, yeah, yeah. So the, the fantasy element, and the, I think when we were kids, of course, it wasn't the internet. It was it was comic books and magazines and, and right. Hit Creator magazine or. Uh, you know, a, a Frankenstein, uh, Dracula comic, or whatever yeah. it was, X Men. And for me, Kiss was represented because of our era, Evil Can Evil. Oh yeah, the Evil superhero Knievel. people, yeah. like wow, you yeah. can do anything you want, almost like sports. Yeah. And Kiss did it. They did. I mean, they talk about branding. I mean, they're like you know, Kiss yeah. invented that crap. You know what I mean? They, you know, they really, they practically had, did. Yeah. yeah, they had movies, they had comic books, they had everything. Yeah, the cartoon. Yeah, I remember. I, it was, kiss on scooby-doo <laughs> yeah i mean oh, it's, i remember that yeah i hear that i hear that you're making a comic book is that correct bob told me that well i got an intertwining story with my new uh solo album and it's got a sort of creature uh vampiric sort of uh uh owl creature that it cool. has mystical qualities a little different than a batman it's got more of like a sort of mystical quality that uses music and pitch and sort of mysticism and we'll show you some of the artwork if you put it up yeah. at whatever point christmas.com yeah. yeah but the story kind of intertwines with my new music and i have a song about jack the ripper on there and of course i'm spinning Very it cool. and it's my new creature and character but the artwork's outstanding it's from russell marx um so the the president we were talking about this before we got started Kilo. i guess so the presentation of that artwork, that, that's sort of still in development, like how you're going to like tie that the in. The comic multi book's a little more on the back burner, but this is gonna wet your whistle, so to speak, about what's coming. And uh, right. uh, what I'm gonna do first is release the material. You're gonna see the artwork, you're gonna see artwork for every song, um, which is gonna start hinting at what the story is. And we might intertwine on the release too, a little bit like a paragraph each of the story and then what's to come is remixes which i have some really interesting people i'm going to work with on that and then uh sort of like i'm going to have a continuation once my uh release comes up i might add a song every and this couple, is still a couple months and this is still this is an owl release or a chris wise solo uh it's it's like a solo record so it's gonna it's if you look up chriswise.com what I've done is taken this thing I've developed my whole life because my last name is Wise. And when we were kids, that's another thing. It, it was the kiss led to the Iron Maiden, which was like this really powerful music. And that's when I heard that that bass sound. And I was it was unique and it wasn't like any other bass. Like I love Bob Daisley. I love Geezer Butler. I love John Paul Jones, Getty Lee. But these, you know, James Jameson. There's so many great players, but Steve made me want to play the bass. I heard the sort of like the punchiness of it, the speed, and I went, oh my God, like this is, <laughs> this is a whole, yeah, of yeah. Iron Maiden. And um, so that really made me want to play, but essentially it's again, the fantasy element, because they have Eddie, yeah. the monster. Right, and right. Everything. So the kiss, the, the, so now I'm sort of a product, uh, a son of those guys in the sense of artistically, Ozzy Osbourne was a really big deal for me. I, I yeah. felt like his songs like Mr. Crowley and, you know, I remember playing I Don't Know and all that. The, the, there was a mystical quality I really appreciated where I'm into the fantasy of it all. So I don't get too caught up with uh, being a soloist, but you'll, you know, be, that being said, it's pretty extreme at right. times. So it's not necessarily, uh, um, it's it's basically it's kind of an extension of who I am, but it's not my singer songwriter stuff I was doing right. with my band. It's a little more on like the soundtrack sounding level. 
but you might have a seven minute song about Jack the Ripper. So mm-hmm. while you take a shower and shave or whatever you do, you just went on a little mini theater journey. You know, it's funny, yeah. I hadn't really thought about this, but Kilo, uh, you and Chris, uh, your, your, your approach to, to cr- making music is, even though it's, it's different styles, he's doing like this, he does, he, Kilo invented this, uh, this genre called terror trap. It's based, it's bass trap, but based on, on horror movies, you can see his logo is an upside down, uh, Michael Myers, Michael, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and it's, it's very similar. He's, it's very visual and it's very cinematic. Yeah. You know, it's similar, yeah. just like you were saying. It's mm. really, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's very cool. Maybe I'll add some upright bass bow to something. Right. Yeah. I mean, oh, it's back home. interesting that you said putting people through a journey, like a mini seven minute journey, because one thing everyone says about anything I work on, including Bob's mixes, is, is it sounds like a movie. Like it sounds like you're going to a movie and experiencing it through your ear. It's like, right. yeah, we can do that as artists, make people see things and experience a whole world without even seeing it in front of them. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, and theater of the mind, like not giving them everything. Yeah. Like, you know, like country music uh, sometimes can be very literal. Like, I right. Woke, right. think it's six and the <laughs> car was broken down and my <laughs> <Yeah. new> girlfriend <laughs> stayed over the new boyfriend's house or whatever. Yeah. It's right, right. Literal. As to where this, you can kind of lay out tones and vibes uh, uh, lyrically that um, leave it open to the listener a little bit. You know, that's that's one of the things. So, yeah, all those things have come together for me. I mean, like exactly who I was probably uh, initially. It's just uh, I'm just a more matured version. In a sense, you know, <laughs> I definitely get that, you know, you know, it's and um, one of the things that, that I when when you're going through and talking about when we were talking about the, the Chris's influences and you mentioned things like like Iron Maiden and Kiss and Ozzy. Now, if you jump fast forward 25 years, right? Kisses, uh, Chris is in LA playing with all those people. You've right. played, you've you've been on, uh, you played on one of Ozzy's albums, right? Like yeah, you play bass on the whole that, album. That, right? that, I always tell the story, uh, but what's funny is, is that innate sense you have as a kid. When I was just 14, 15, I was in love with Ozzy and Maiden and Black Sabbath. And I said to uh, my mother and father, I'm like, you know, mom and dad, I'm going to Hollywood one day and I'm going to play with Ozzy. That's awesome. And they were like, that's nice, son. You know, that's, you know, <laughs> that's great. That's Keep great. living. Yeah, keep going. So it, it was quite the uh, excellent feeling to call them up from the studio with Ozzy in the background and be working on his new album. And then it, it came out on a, a there's actually two releases, essentially one album. It came out, we added stuff to it, and then it came out as its own release, a cover record, uh, Undercover. Right. And uh, so great fun. And then, yeah, I did. I ended up spending about four years with Ace Frehley and uh, yeah, they, played tracks on his record. Right. So Ace Frehley, guitar player from Kiss. Chris ends up again, you know, he's obsessed with with Kiss as a kid. And then as an adult, he becomes the bass player in Ace's band for how many years? He about played, four. About yeah. Four years. Toured all around the world. You know, that's when you were. Uh, it was, it was, and then uh, that was after the cult. Which so Chris also was the bass player in the band The Cult, and I don't know if you, anybody's heard of The Cult, but I'm I that, then he was playing with one of my heroes, you know, because I grew, I love yeah. The Cult. That was about it. a decade back then. So yeah, it's, it's it's this has spilled out over uh, you know the last uh, twenty five years in L A. and uh, I never you know bugged anyone like please get me to. Uh, the, the guys in the cult, or I never like said, please get me to Ace Frehley. Right. Although I did kind of have a, a a meeting that sort of led to it, of course, and things like that. But uh, the Hollywood Vampires were by accident. I mean, I I thought they were an amazing group, especially since they were developing into more of an original band. They kind of had a tribute vibe about them at first, and um, I Ace Band opened up for Alice Cooper's band in Australia. So then, boom, I'm hanging out, and Tommy, who's in the Hollywood Vampires, and kind of creative force behind the whole thing um he, he was like I, you know i think you're the new guy for the band and it, like things develop naturally when you're doing your craft and stuff like that so right. I, I i everyone always asks me about like so did you have an agent so you get these kinds of questions right. a lot like how do you meet these kinds of people and 
the thing is you have to be in the game to begin with of music you have to like kind of you put your whole body and, and soul into it yeah. and you go this is what i'm doing and so when i was in hollywood i just you know i was teaching i was playing and then all of a sudden it led to joining bands and uh, being on the road a lot so one thing leads to another because you're constantly on stage you're constantly doing little interviews or whatever promoting an album and right. you meet the right people you know people recognize like oh wow i like that about you let's well, work yeah. together and i was gonna you say know? it doesn't hurt being you know an exceptional musician i mean <laughs> really oh, that, that thanks helps. True. <laughs> true you have to have the talent there you gotta have um, the best, but... something, Go ahead. something you just pointed out was something we talk about about our podcast which is if it if it happens naturally, it's kind of like something you should be doing, right? Like you were pointing out about being in those bands, because like we haven't we've haven't messed up thoroughly yet with the podcast. We've messed up in good ways rather than bad ways. And it's like, well, then that maybe means that's where we're supposed to go with this. Right. Which I think that rings true to any creative element of life in any way, not just being a musician or an artist, but anything you do creative. If it just kind of flows, and, and we talk about the art of flow a lot, kind of that flow mindset where it just kind of works out for you. And I think that's cool that you pointed that out too, because we've had numerous people point that out. Right. Set, set up your situation. And, and, and you know, it's, it, it, you know, like what we're talking about, like that, that, that kind of Zen mentality where it's just like you get in position, the place, the time that you should be. And you, you do as you do, as, you do your job and you do it well, you know, I mean, that's the thing you're, you're in your space, you do your thing. And if you're where you're supposed to be, then things will progress as they should. You know yeah, I, mean? I, I didn't, I didn't pursue it because I was getting bad results, you know, I right. was getting good results. And um, that was my guide. And, and, and another thing too, a lot of musicians are so like hustly right now, you know, because of the right. Stuff you know that like everybody's trying to make some money. everyone's trying to yeah they're, they're but also social media wise and stuff like yeah. that it's a it's a whole different kind of realm where you know you could hit on something completely different than um going deep 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 deep, deep into your craft like i did and playing upright bass with a bow and writing all these songs and stuff. sometimes you can just have a quirky little kind of uh new little sound and talent and it'll blow you up so there's it's it's not necessary to have chops it's not necessary to uh do that to write cool songs so i, I you know i always encourage everyone just do your th whatever inspires you creates mm -hmm. that passion for you because right. i had a passion for this I, I had it because of that background with the battle of the bands and stuff right. i also had kind of almost like a i hate to call it this because when i do music it's really just from the heart but there was still a bit of this sportsman's like uh, sportsman's like quality where we would see a band and see a guitar player or drummer or bass player or singer or whatever even keyboard player anything actually um and be like oh my god that guy's hot we have to make sure we smoke him when we play next <laughs> right. to him. you know right. like on the someone on the bass i'm like i have to annihilate that guy when we play <laughs> next time you know <laughs> there can great. be no competition you know <laughs> so there is a different kind of element i'm not sure everyone's inspired by that but i don't care that's just i have a little bit of that like i thought i was going to play soccer believe it or not i thought i was going to play basketball you know <laughs> I, I, I just didn't you know the reason, there, there, i didn't know where to put it i don't know? think people <laughs> understand how that why that's funny but uh the we're, we're I mean, although chris's last name is wise and I, i'm smith our mother's main name is mcdonald and the mcdonald's are not tall people <laughs> yeah well, the, mom's side no but um your dad's pretty I, tall. I'm just sort of in between. I'm, yeah, you're I'm what they call it average size. I right, can always yeah. shop at the store and get medium. Uh, <laughs> right. But a uh, medium shirt always works, medium pants or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I had no business playing basketball. So thank <laughs> thank goodness um I had find found that outlet. And that's really what it's all about. Whatever it is, it's like if you're turned on by you know country music or jazz or hip-hop i mean go in there and and maybe have some of that fire you know be a little fiery fine go up against you know maybe the local band and you know do that stuff it's yeah. good for you you it know is, yeah. we're taking all this like equalizing kind of you know and, and uh conceptual stuff where all music should be kind of to me it's all the same it's like the same art no matter what it is so right. I, I relate to all musicians as long as they're kind of 
passionate, right? You know, right. You know, um, so could you explain? Well, go ahead, Bob, but no, I wanted no. to explain no. his songwriting process to our audience because he was talking about, you know, going into writing songs and maybe not everybody goes in and does the upright bass stuff. So, like, run us through your regular day or time period of doing a song from when you think of the concept to when the song is done recording. How does that all work? I usually have kind of a, a theme and usually a story in mind that I want to convey. Yeah. And everything is about this song on, uh, if you go to chriswise.com, there's a sample of a song called Jack. And that's sort of my own little Jack the Ripper story. And that's what our Jack the Ripper song was called in my metal band. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, that would guide me. And then everything I do in this song is telling the story of what I'm trying to convey. And then every sound I make is trying to feed into the sounds that would complement those lyrics and those tones and songs. So that's what it is. It's like all the bells and whistles and stuff are really like, you know, the ornaments on the Christmas tree and the chops and stuff like that. That's just dressing up the story, you know, right. and making it, making yeah, it we, we call it the Mexican like seasoning. That's what my old producer friend called it like when you add the little like bells and whistles and the little drum fills and the little things like putting the seasoning on top of the next a little bit of salsa on there. A little yeah. salsa. Well, <laughs> you know, in LA you can go to just so many, so many parts of town and get the best kind of street tacos. <laughs> exactly. What's up with New York not being able to get a taco? I don't understand. <laughs> or a good burrito. I mean there's some. Yeah. And then over there the pizza well, I was gonna say, you know, right. don't just do your right. Because I've had pizza in LA, and it's just nothing. Yeah, we have California pizza, meaning <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a different pizza. thing entirely. Yeah. I do know some. I do know of a few places: Mulberries on Canaan and Beverly Hills, Vito's on La Cienega. Oh yeah, that's a great one. That's a real traditional pizza. And there's Joe's, and that's up on Sunset, kind of on the Strip there. There's the three people. If you're in LA, you need <laughs> pizza. Learn good pizza. Yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, that's that's kind of the uh, the whole spectrum of, of I guess how I think about the songs and, and, and so on. You know? I have a question. When you're um, so I know like uh, when you record. I, well, I don't know. So I'll say that I know that in the past, yeah. a lot of your recording process has been. Yeah, like in studio, like in professional studios, right? I mean, whether it was in Dan's place in Albany or places in out in LA. Now, um, are you recording at home? Are you going? Are you going to other people's home studios? Or you're go still going into like major production studios? Uh, well, working? it's a lot easier than it was years ago. So right. yeah, um, I've worked with um, over the years. I've worked with engineers and and like people helping me. Uh, just be the artist so I can come in and focus on my vocal or the bass track or produce. Um, I'm not so much a hands-on engineer type, but I'm a producer where, you know, if I need one dB, uh, you know, or whatever of the bass and, and I want a little more one K and like, you know, I mean, we grew up in the language of studios because we would actually turn the dial right, back yeah. then. Right. Yeah. I was going to say, you're really talking about producer in the more classical sense where like a record producer nowadays, are, you know, record producers are often guys like Kilo who are making, you know, doing the whole thing there on their computer, making beats and making yeah. music. But uh, you know, the producers, the Bob rock producers of the world are the, the Spangali guys that sat there going, turn that up, turn that down. Right. All right, you get in there, do a background vocal. You know what I mean? And that's yeah, yeah, I think for me it was like, you know, uh, and I've worked with all these great guys like Bob Rock and Chris Goss, Marty Fredrickson, um, on and on, like just amazing top notch producers. So my yeah, my thing's more like I'm producing, keeping an eye on the prize as opposed to being the engineer but it's all the same stuff i mean you know if if if, if i was hitting the keyboard versus someone else i mean i don't know would be the you know what i mean <laughs> right on. i just didn't really develop a lot of great pro tool skills and, and and in time maybe i'll just do it all myself you know so but the point is is really um we can do anything anywhere on the hollywood vampires record we were on the road uh tommy says hey wise i'm like what's up man can you bring your bass over right now and let's do a track? And I'm like, sure. And we just had two headphones. They had the track all done. He had sort of um, 
uh, just rough bass on it. He did himself. And I went in there and did a few takes and he goes, I think we got it. And I said, oh, great. That's and <laughs> cool. That ended up on the album and we were like in Germany or something and, and yeah. have to do a show a couple hours later. Yeah. So. We should mention, by the way, who the, I mean, if folks don't know who the Hollywood vampires are, because it's, it's. Oh, a, right. Yeah. So the Hollywood vampires are a super group, a LA based super group of, uh, and I mean, super group, right. You get uh, Chris, of course, on the bass. Uh, Joe Perry of the Aeros of Aerosmith on guitar, uh, Alice Cooper of Alice Cooper, <laughs> all of these people of Alice the Rock Cooper. and Roll Hall of Fame, you know what I mean? Right, right. On vocals and uh, also on guitar, Johnny Depp, who yeah. was Johnny Depp, and uh, and and Chris, and then uh, a couple we got, other. Yeah, we got drums. Glenn Sobel um, from the Alice Cooper band, who's a monster drummer but he plays tastefully and he's matured and you know it's uh he's he's awesome i don't think we really communicate much verbally glenn and i we just kind of we've always just since the beginning just one little look and we're locked in it's he's one of those great drummers he's a pleasure to play right then we have buck johnson from aerosmith that was uh he's been playing keyboards and background vocals with Steven Tyler and Aerosmith and that's a hell of a job. Yeah. <laughs> the lead vocal is already insane and then oh, this, there's Buck going above it harmonizing all night. Yeah. It's insane. And um, we have Tommy Hendrickson on the guitar and he's he's really part of the group in the sense of he's been there since the beginning co-writing producing right. and so he produced the well, he's the guy you said it's the creative kind of force behind he's kind of pulls everyone together. Yeah he's played the he's kind of fallen into the producer role and then produced the album and right. so um and cheryl cooper uh alice's wife mm -hmm. is off stage singing backgrounds which people don't know so this is kind of a fun little oh, cool. uh, and she's part of the alice cooper show and and dresses up and plays a role right uh, a couple different roles throughout the show um yeah, so that's a tremendous thing but of course because of the cancellations and stuff we haven't done any live shows okay. in a bit um and these fingers crossed for everything yeah. coming together. But, these live shows, I, I, you know, when this goes public, when we publish this, I'll, we'll have a bunch of links to stuff. And you can go to Chris's website and a bunch of other things. I'll probably post a link to maybe one of these videos too, because when we were talking about live shows, I mean, everything we've talked up about up to this point, most of it, if like we're talking about clubs in Albany or clubs in LA or whatever, but these are arena event. I mean, he's playing, Chris is playing in front of 50,000 people, you know, or, or more. And it's, it's, a, yeah, it's impressive. Time, yeah. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, there's some great stuff out there uh, that that's online and stuff with the vampires. And, you know, it's funny, it kind of built up to it a lot. You know, it was like um, the cult played a lot of those same festivals. Ace played a lot of those same festivals. But suddenly the vampires are like direct support yeah. way up on the bill. So it kind of yeah. became a little more, you know, it was, it was there was a little more electricity in the air. And even though you're, you know, you're, you're surrounded by literal legends right uh yeah you're you're yeah, they're, you're they're an active, but you're an active member of the band i, I like like uh like uh, what are they oh this is this will be a nice tie-in too because we talk about the famous people and stuff that you've worked with and met and everything and one of the great things is the great late great lemmy kilminster who the bassist of motorhead and just one of the coolest rock dudes that's ever lived and been on the planet uh you know he passed away uh, about what four or five years ago and uh, when he did, Chris posted this great picture of the two of them because you you hung out with Lemmy. And uh, yeah, I would see him all the time. I right. mean, and Lemmy was everyone's friend. He was kind of uh, a staple at the Rainbow, which he was kind of in the back playing his uh, his video game poker, or whatever it was. <laughs> I never really got into that, but uh, you know, Lemmy was always there. And one night, I remember being in the Rainbow and hanging out and. I had a Guinness and Lemmy had his uh, Jack and Coke and he's smoking and and I, I was talking about how I really appreciated his distortion sound and originally how he got it and having an aggressive bass tone and I was like oh man Lemmy it's it's getting time for me to go I gotta get up early and be out of here he's all right man we'll see you later that's good Lemmy. and um, <laughs> it sounds I like see it. him all the time you know bass to bass talk and just telling funny stories and so I go to the airport the next morning, the cult has a tour to start and we fly to Amsterdam and uh, we check into the American hotel. And uh, of course it's like a day or so later. And uh, as we're walking towards the elevator, it opens up and who is it? 
it's Lemmy. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and awesome. we didn't, we were like, like, what the hell's going on, man? What are you, <laughs> what are you doing here? It's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, we're just hanging out the other night. We didn't even speak about, you know, you to where place. we were going so or funny. anything. Right. Because it's the thing about Lemmy was it wasn't, it, it was a lot of just about like checking in and he'd have stories and right. And like what was Hendrix like or whatever, you know, I'd learned <laughs> so Hendrix much. Like, you know, just getting to, being able to ask someone that question. Yeah, it's just fun time. stuff. And a lot of the thing about him was that I have to say it was great. It wasn't because I was in the cult or I was like some yeah, uh, you know, peer like member necessarily, which I kinda was. And, you know, right. he's much more experienced well, yeah, than but, all that. But uh he's just cool the, the thing was anyone could probably go up to him and, and say hello and take a picture. And that's what I mean. He was kind of everyone's friend. And that but, but that's a great experience because um uh, I have all these funny stories that come to mind once we start talking that's about because awesome. I'd see yeah. it all the time. You know? I've heard a funny story I want to hear about when you um saw one of the members of the Who at a hotel, I think it was. <laughs> Yeah, we were talking about. Uh, I told, yeah. hey, I, I told Kilo real quick before we tell that. I just want to mention the reason. Yeah, sorry. Right? No, that's okay. The reason I brought up Lemmy is because now you flash forward a few years, and uh, Chris actually sings and plays. He he plays Lemmy the Lemmy part in Ace of Spades when the vampires play. So. Oh yeah, that's, that's, a, yeah. that's right. That, that, that Wonderful was, song. Yeah, <laughs> the vampires would be kind of. Uh, based around that tribute concept and funny enough here here's the story the hollywood vampires is something alice cooper was in which was a drinking group that got sent up yeah. they were unruly yeah. so they got the den upstairs and was it I, like lennon john lennon part of it too yeah and like everybody. nick jagger all these crazy john Bonham, yeah, 70s rockers yeah keith all. moon Jeez. all these kind of they were such wild men that they the, i guess the owner sent them upstairs and that <laughs> was the concept of the hollywood vampires all the dead drunk friends <laughs> and then it turned in more original so uh, awesome. yeah i was doing uh, ace of spades and doing my best lemmy but the who thing was the cult uh right. the cult was opening up for the who in europe and um i remember being in catering it was actually backstage and we were kind of uh mike dimkich who was the rhythm guitar player at the time and i were in catering i don't know grabbing coffee and a sandwich or whatever it was and um we were like, we kind of just were hanging around. There was a view of the hall and we went, oh my God, it's Audrey's <laughs> coming. And, you know, because we hadn't met him yet, uh, you know, Billy met him and knew him a bit or whatever, but Mike and I were kind of like. And it's we, Roger Daltrey. Yeah, we, we, Andy had his shirt <laughs> on and he was ripped. He was like in great shape. And uh, at the so, time, like a 65 year old man. Yeah, and, like, no, I, you know, you know. these guys are different like you know look at Keith they're just Keith. built different yeah they're just built different. they've been they've been doing it too they're the inner constitution is like i'm a big rock star it's very different but um he came down the hall and the funny thing was was mike and i's reaction we were both like looking around for an escape because we were like i'm not worthy of hanging out <laughs> and, and theatering with this guy and of course you know we're on tour together he's on the side of the stage watching the whole show some night right. we got to say hello oh, quite a bit and um but the first still as a grown man a grown-ass man and another grown-ass man that's basically seen and done a, an unheard amount of like hollywood shenanigans and bands and stuff still had that guttural still like, starstruck oh my god you know so we just we ran out of the catering room like little kids <laughs> oh were, no yeah <laughs> and we're on tour like we're the opening act you know uh so that was funny i told bob that just because I think we were talking about how forever stay the fan. Yeah, we were you at know. your mom's house and telling stories. And another one you told at the time too was I think from the same tour was uh, uh, and this I love this one because I mean and these are you know again Chris and I come from musically somewhat different backgrounds, but we, you know where we overlap would be in some band like this, like mm -hmm. like the Who and the Stones. I'm a mm -hmm. huge Stones fan, and uh, I just love the story you told me about about Keith walking out on stage like the band's playing. You tell it. There's a band's playing, and like Keith. I well, don't know. There's something. Well, okay. Well, which one well, is this? well, you know, so like you mean Keith or well, uh, Keith Richards, right? So like the the Stones are playing and they're doing their thing. The plan, oh, yeah. and okay. you know, and you know, and there's no Keith on stage, right? But the the the, the band and they're they're going for a few minutes, warming up the tune, and then Keith strut, struts out on stage and just, and, and just like hits one chord, 
Oh yeah, well, actually, the, the rock and roll moment that I love, people might know he does this or whatever. This is when I was in the cult, we had a day off, the Stones were playing, management hooks us up, we go, and um, Keith Richards, big rock and roll moment, it wasn't about the guitar, he, he had no guitar. <laughs> and he walked out on stage and he just sort of had this like, senoras and senoritas. <laughs> that was it, and the whole crowd, <laughs> Like like a response like I've never even seen before went ballistic. Imagine you know? that. that we're, in Milan, we're in Milan, Italy. At the time. You got you got the 70,000 people in front of you, and you just say, and it was Hola. That's <laughs> all he said. So I mean, like, you know, that's some power right there. Then he got his guitar and went into uh one of the great blues songs he plays, or whatever. But that that was really special, you know. I got to do a uh, track with Mick Jagger uh early two thousands and and uh on his solo album and uh that was exciting and you know yeah, i got to hang sense. with him after the session and he had like a a cook come in and he had all this wine and we hung out for like a few hours that was marty frederickson I, that's cool and so the, the funny thing was danny saber another producer i used to live in laurel canyon was mick was very progressive so he was at that time he had like three or four producers he was working with for this one album which was kind of ahead of its time a wee bit you know and um so i'm going out to get my mail on uh, wonderland the famous kind of i used to live on wonderland jim morrison neighborhood and it was a crazy house you were in like, yeah that was something <laughs> that, was awesome. that, that had it all kind of built i had a, a development deal for my band and all this stuff so i had this kind of uh Hollywood home and there everything. It was like eh, piano pink, stairs. Pink fur on the yeah, walls and piano stairs. It, it was crazy. It, it wasn't a uh, it wasn't a buy. It was a rental. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it was a great band house and all that. So I was always kind of going out to get the mail, and this limo pulls in front of the house, and I'm like, "Who the heck's this?" But Wonderland School's over there, so it, it could be anybody's rich father or something. And uh, yeah, it's the, like the school where all the rock star kids go. To. Yeah, it's in the middle of Hollywood. So you get all that kind of stuff. But uh, I, I just played with Mick like a week before and I did this bass session with him. And here I am getting the mail and I'm like, literally like God knows how I'm dressed, you know, and, and not wanting to bump in any, and into anyone. And the window slowly comes down and I turn around mm -hmm. and he goes, hey, Chris, and it's Mick Jagger. And I'm just <laughs> like, Mick, what are you, oh my God, what are you doing here? And I went up to the window and talked to him. He was just going up the road to uh, work on more music with Danny Saber, my friend that lived up the road. So um, that's, you can't, you can't that's plan insane. that stuff. No, that's just, like, that's, that is a crazy You story. can't plan that stuff. <laughs> I'm going to get my mail and Mick Jagger pulls up to say that, That's why I relocated <laughs> myself from the area. So like when the live music scene started really like, you could literally play around here a few days a week. I mean, back like yeah. in that like eight late eighties, early nineties. Oh, I, I, I played five nights a week yeah. for most I mean, of the nineties. Yeah, I, so I was constantly on tour. It's almost it. like if there was a bar with a big enough space, there was bound at least a little acoustic act yeah. would be there. Every place had music. Um, when that changed, that's why I had to relocate, yep. put myself really in the thick of it, because this area was was not just the area, the whole country, the whole world was kind of tapping into more pop and DJs and things. And suddenly that changed the groove. I remember the drinking age was 18, right? So I was holding out for 18. I was sneaking in clubs <laughs> and we had a fake ID back then. You could chalk the ID and have like some girlfriend that was really good at art or makeup or whatever do it. And it would look pretty dang good. And you just flash it. And there we were 16, 17 yeah. going into all the clubs. Um, you know, so that's what changed. That's the reason why I left because there wasn't anything really feeding me, uh, me feeding into a crowd and that's that cyclic thing you need that was, it was dying. And unless you put an immense amount of effort to kind of build the house, um, it was all changing. So being in Hollywood was, was really one of the smartest things I did. You know, sure. if you really want to do it, you got to kind of be like, <clears throat> completely in on it you can't you can't be like well you know i'm gonna give this a go but here's my b plan i haven't really seen that work out for people no I, I, well i can you tell know. you i'll tell you firsthand i mean because that was me yeah mm -hmm. that's basically been my music career right i kept mm -hmm. the, the the day job for uh, you know for 20 some odd years yeah. and granted for half of that i was working in the music business but i was still it was but i was but i was sitting at a desk and i was talking on the phone i was 
you know what I mean? And playing when I could. And then got into corporate America, did the same thing. Only now am I really finally understanding really what you're saying. And you're right. You know, basically, <clears throat> I just said, you know what? I'm going to just go in. You know what I mean? I'm just going to commit myself to being a creative person, right? Because I write and I, and I make music. And, uh, and as soon as I made that decision, I, you know, I hooked up with Kilo here. I got the blog took off and I, and I got a record deal. And it's like, that's something I'd wanted for 35 yeah. years. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I've been trying to get that since I was a teenager. That's great. And then like, right. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's but, great. But I mean, the reason, but the right. reason, I think the reason it happened is because I did what you're saying, which is saying, you know, you got to just be all in. You got to say, this is what I do now. You know? Yeah. And, and, and even, you know, for the younger guys, you know, that are coming up and stuff, I mean, uh, Try and stay single, man. I mean, you know, and I, 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 I'm yeah. seriously, I, and I'm not even talking about having the fun you can have when you're single, which that might benefit you too. But um, if if you're really deep into something, it it's just the basic uh, common sense of how much time do you have. Right. If you're really committed to your career, you're young enough. You're like 21 years old. I mean, man, you got plenty of time. Like go get that career stuff like yeah. make that everything Absolutely. and then then you got plenty of time hopefully you know you have good health or whatever you got a long time i mean to think that some of my peak moments are going to happen decades later um was unheard of like when you were telling we were talking as kids and you talk about uh late 20s even 30s 40s oh, yeah. you'd be like what are you talking you'd be retired you're done <laughs> yeah. 27 you're done <laughs> yeah so it's not true and now we're seeing artists of all kinds of ages having long enduring careers or even being discovered later in life you know so know. like <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> you're young in life or just not kids you know? <laughs> there you go you know um because uh because we could probably do this all day because this is a lot of fun but um we should uh, before because we're, i think we're getting on an hour already and i want to make sure that we talk about your new music you know what you're oh, doing yeah. I, I know that we, we mentioned your uh you know your your project your multimedia rock project you also mentioned that you were doing currently working on some like acoustic stuff you're playing a singer songwriter kind of stuff right yeah so uh, the the uh, aside from the solo album which i'm doing um and I'll explain that a little bit too, but um, essentially because of all the cancellations and all the tours and uh, Hollywood vampires two years in a row, but also there's like, we were talking about, there's like 10 other things that happen when you're a musician, like side right. projects, corporate kind of all-star bands, everything got canceled. So I said, how can I get control of my career a little more again with, with playing live because I'm missing it. Um, and that's kind of, recording playing live that's it that's the whole thing right. and so i needed to play live again so i'm working with my friend eric bradley who uh, is a great singer songwriter himself fantastic and um he and i met in the jerry cantrell band so we did a lot of singing together it's tons of harmonies and Alice in chains material so that's kind of how we met and uh, ryan brown is the drummer from zappa plays zappa with dweezil which means He's insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Because yeah, yeah. you know, you know, if you play Zappa, well, then if you can yeah. play one song sometimes, <laughs> it, it, it might take you a year to memorize yeah. this thing. Ryan's a monster, but Ryan's got all the feel and stuff. And uh, so the three of us have an acoustic kind of um, pared down, unplugged, whatever you like to call it, inspired by um, picking songs off the cuff, like Hyacinth House from The Doors I Sing. Eric will sing uh, uh, Psycho Killer from oh, um, Talking Heads, Talking Heads right for example. On. We're picking off the cuff. I'm singing uh, uh, Andy Warhol from David Bowie. Nice. Which is, so what we're doing is our, we're picking covers that are like, you might go, yeah, I know this, but it's not that it's right. not it's kind of deep. It's not like my fire. We're picking something different <clears throat> right. and, and a little quirky and artsy. And then we're incorporating original music. So some of my, uh, songs I've done with Owl over the years in this acoustic fashion. He's got a Martin, got a pared down drum kit, a little percussion, and I've got my Martin acoustic bass. So it's really that unplugged TV, MTV unplugged kind of vibe, but we're getting a little eccentric. And instead of having the cello player and all the guests and stuff like that, we're sort of making it up ourselves. I'm incorporating the bow. 
but the fun is we will have guests you know I, I i know like a friend of mine scott coogan from the ace Frehley band mm -hmm. i'd love to have him sing a couple zeppelin but then we're mixing it up we're doing our own little versions and also we're doing like um you know half originals and we might have a violin are, guest maybe are you recording backpack. any of these live shows we we will we're, we're about to get into it this year oh, cool. um you know uh we, we're we're pretty much ready to play and we just decided we're going to do a few more rehearsals and maybe bust out at the viper room opening opening for someone right. or uh oh that's a great a lot of places around town yeah uh when we're acoustic, since we're acoustic we can literally have two speakers on stands and two monitors and pull it off so now we're available for your backyard barbecue. okay <laughs> so you know what i mean so that's the whole reason why i did it like <clears throat> And maybe maybe we will do some little parties and things, but the whole point is I'm going back to my roots. It's all about playing, and the work ethic's no different if you're doing this or if you're getting ready for an, an, a you know a twenty thousand seater or something. It's mm -hmm. the same thing. So it's all about doing this craft. But I think it's going to be really good because it seems like there there keeps being cancellations for all three of us in the band. Um, and so like it's looking like we'll have a little time this year to actually be playing shows again even if they're on the smaller level i'm i'm satisfied i like playing in front of people so right. and i like bringing people together like our moms are downstairs having tea right now <laughs> and i don't know how many shows i've had in new york city yeah. uh where bob comes out bob and sarah comes out and um uh, and comes out his mom my aunt and and the wonderful thing about playing is is using that event not just for the show but it, you always have that dinner beforehand with your family and cousins and stuff so i really want to get that going again even if it's on that kind of home brew level that i'm talking about right on. so we'll definitely be talking about i'll tell you guys about those dates and now my solo record is a little more of an extravaganza where maybe i'm playing a bass guitar line i'm putting two or three bows on top and doing things unorthodox and you know there's drums it's kind of in a rock fashion but it's a little more of a soundtrack but it's so kind of like harmonizing chords with the yeah. bass like yeah and, and, and but there i'm singing I'm, I'm the lead singer i've been the lead singer in owl but um i'm using it more as like i don't have to have abc i'm singing a section that sounds like a choir and i'm dressing things up with my voice and then there's lyrics and stuff but I'm taking liberties where it's not the three minute little ABC package and pop. That's right. that's kind of what the fun is. And there's some serious bass traps for the people that are into the uh, it's kind of musical aspects beyond the theater of the mind. So, and also before I forget, Glenn Sobel from the Vampires just did a guest track on my record. Nice. And uh, yeah. I'm working on a couple more guests as well. So. I'm getting some good feedback about yeses for guests. So we'll see who can actually That's awesome, uh, do it. Yeah. Very cool. Very nice. All right. And then, so um, one thing we do, and I, I'll do, I kill it. Do you have any other, uh, I was going to go to the, the random questions, but you know, I wanted to see if you had any uh, other um, directions. I, kinda, I mean, I guess I would love to touch back on what he was saying about not having a backup plan real fast just because I've mentioned this in the past interviews and I think he said something really cool. I always like to tell people, it's kind of like you're driving in a desert and you pass a sign that says like, next gas station is like a hundred miles other than the next one right here. And it's like, you know, you've already gone past this one too far because you don't have enough gas and you gotta hope you make it to the one you get to. You have to put yourself on that road in that situation, in my opinion, to make it where you're like, I know I can't go back. There is no more backwards. Now let's just see if I can go forward or I'm going to die here in the desert. You know, I don't know. I mean, don't you think, Bob, that's kind of how the mindset and, and, you, and, it, and I am very pleased that you pointed out that you did not choose that path at first. Right, because I mean, we can sit here and say it works for us, but if we see the other side of the coin and we can say, and it doesn't work this way, it almost makes a bigger impact than just saying, well, it worked for me, you know. Right. So I think that's cool that even even he who had wonderful opportunities right at the jump, like still 
understand that you really need to have no backup plan for things to work out the way you really envision them to be. So exactly. that's all. Yeah, the mystery of life, so to speak. You know, I mean, um, <clears throat> I've always said this. I don't know if it's entirely true, but I think it's partially true. It's like, I don't know if the universe or the whatever, the elements and the chemistry of everything moving around us care about you as much when you're playing it safe. Right. Something right. about being daring and bold in a good way, in a positive way, trying to make something happen. There's something about that that is is sort of the uh, the aspect of mysticism I like because now you're working with your solely your brain and trusting, and you're like it's gonna happen. And there's some sort of th something about that with the will, but you don't need to connect all the dots because you don't want it. Like I wouldn't want to right. want to have known my journy. Right. It's too colorful now for me to have ever written before I did it. Right, and right. My life experience at this point is such that, like, I, I couldn't have had this perception I had before I had all the all that. You know what I mean? So, um, I shouldn't have written my story because I didn't know what I know now. So just right, go, right. It. go exactly. fly. It. Don't jump off the cliff because uh, we know what that's going to be. But but <laughs> may, maybe pass the the uh, rest stop. <laughs> there you go. Uh, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. It's, uh, fortune favors the bold. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. Fortune favors the bold. I like that. Yeah, it's, it's, a, nice I think it's Shakespeare. I'm not going to take credit for it, but <laughs> <laughs> but it's, why not take yeah, credit? Sure, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, sure. You came up with it, Bob. You came up with everything. Don't worry. <laughs> Awesome. So yeah, like Bob said before, this is the point in the show that's my personal favorite, where we ask one of us, each of the hosts asks a question. So one of us will ask an industry question, and one of us will ask a random life question, like what's your favorite kind of water bottle, or like, well, you know, whatever. And then he, Chris, this time will ask a question of any sort. And all three of us have to answer all three questions. So if you're going to ask a dumb question, that you don't feel like answering, probably don't ask. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, if you're like, well, I'm going to bait them into saying this, then yeah, you're still going to have to answer it. So yeah. um, go ahead, Bob, you go first this time, since okay. I don't know my question yet. Well, I don't, I had one. Um, so I don't, and, you know, and usually Kilo and I will swap, one of us will ask the, the personal question, one of us will ask the, uh, the, sure. the music question. I, and I don't know whose turn it is, but I, I was going to ask, uh, and when I say personal, I'm not talking personal. It's just fun. Um, or it can be if you want. It can be if you want. Yeah, I was originally, my original question was about pizza because you're in LA. <laughs> I mean, but we've already answered that. Yeah. So um, I'll ah. ask, yeah, so I'll ask a music question. All and, right. Uh, so what is the oldest instrument that you still have? What's, what's the instrument you're, you're, you know, that you still have and you play? Uh, I really regret, you know, getting rid of some sure and because oh, sometimes okay. you, you have an idea at the time and 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 sometimes you look back and you're wrong because i had a, a really nice vintage gibson ripper was my first bass that honey nice. one with the little yeah. five knob thing on it i was so into steve harris i needed this p bass like one so i got a ibanez roadster which looking back not a good <laughs> choice but it served me at the time because I, I think i got the tones and things i needed sure. um it was a, the gibson was a little less attack or something and i was just addicted to that maple next steve harris thing but the the base i still have the oldest one is the uh upright k okay yeah. oh right on yeah, yeah. very cool um, so i have my upright k that i started college with and that was like 87 and that's a 1950s base uh, I have a 1954 neck on my sort of Frankenstein P bass, which is on every record. Yeah, that's the the, the white one, right? Isn't it's that... a it's a sunburst one, and Sun, I, that's right, I yeah. sort of made it my own. I put a, a jazz pickup in it, so I'd have more versatility. Mm -hmm. I barely use the jazz pickup because the P sounds so good. Mm -hmm. So it's a traditional P bass, but it's got the Tele neck on a 95 body. It's got the contour body. Cool. It's really cool, and but. Uh, you know that that's really it i've changed it up over the years because i moved a bunch and it was uh right it was kind of like i had fancy jazz basses and they went out the window to get rock basses and stuff right, right that's it well cool all right and then we have to answer the questions too so and uh, this is an easy one for me the reason you know because i had to think of a question quick because the, the pizza thing was used up so <laughs> my answer i thought of it because my answer is right back there it's that okay. uh, 
1973 Fender Elite One. It was my first electric guitar. Oh, that's, that's yeah, yeah. I did the, nice. I kind of cussed. It was originally red, um, you know, when I was uh, young and didn't realize, uh, you what know, you were doing. <laughs> how, how valuable the, 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 the very rare guitar was. I stripped the paint off and painted it black and put that checkerboard guitar, you know, and the yeah. different and the different pickup on it too. It's a different, it's a less yeah. fall pickup. I get it. It's like getting rid of the Gibson. Yeah, yeah. The Ibanez. yeah I, didn't exactly. know what, I didn't know what I was it's doing. It's still a pretty sweet guitar though. So that's my answer. So Kilo, what's your what, what's your um, oldest maybe I gear? have two that come to mind because I'm not sure which came first, the chicken or the egg. But um it is either this African drum, this one African drum that I had since I was two. So it's like actual like leather drumstick thing and like like actual cow hide or some animal hide like drum. Either that or it's the marimba that's sitting right beside me. That is only in C major, which sucks, but that's okay because you can still find some of the notes you want. And I like I like fucking around with it coming up with ideas because I'm a drummer. So hitting something as hard as I can that has a melody in mind helps me. So that's my answer for that question. Okay, now it's my turn to ask a question. Interesting. Um, since you had mentioned stuff about comic books, and I, I absolutely love comic books myself, why don't we ask the question, what is the First comic book you remember getting into and why? Mm, wow, uh, that's a wild one. I I I remember like was it Doctor Strange? Oh, the yeah. guy that looked kind of a vampire and it was the X Men, yeah, yeah. was it? Yeah, oh, that, yeah, he's a Marvel. 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 So he's yeah. he's been in the, yeah. the next man. He's been an adventure at, at the Avengers. You know, I, he's I, kind of yeah. Of I, I had a lot. We had you know the Hulk and Batman and things like that, but. Mm -hmm. I, I think the one that kind of stands out was the Hellraiser guy on oh, the yeah. motorcycle as a kid. Oh, his, um, I remember Ghost, that. Yeah. Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider, right. I love Gosh, Ghost Rider. I have an old collection of them I gave to my little brother, Sean. So That's awesome. I, it's probably worth a million dollars, that, that suitcase <laughs> yeah, really? and stuff. I don't even know what's in there. But yeah, I, I had all the DC stuff. I remember every, every, you know, we grew up Irish Roman Catholics. So every Sunday we'd be coming mm -hmm. out of church and my dad would stop by this little bakery down <laughs> place and there was a rack of comics so after church i'd always get a comic book sort right of on. a reward for sitting there That's <laughs> awesome. right, right you put up with this story so you get <laughs> yeah, yeah there you go <laughs> yeah incredible. so that was the, that, that was the earliest of days you know us kids loved all that stuff oh yeah yeah absolutely i would say I, I i'm trying to you know there was superman of course and all the classics but what was the other one the guy that was on fire all the time well, you had oh, the, uh, the Human Torch. The Human Torch. Yeah, that yeah. What group of what, what well, Fantastic Four, there which was go. which is actually I'll, I'll that's my answer to the question. Oh. Is the fantastic the first comic I remember having is Fantastic Four is because uh, uh, I, well, I loved comic books as we all did, and you know we're all geeky rockers, right? And uh, it's the original and, iPad. Exactly. Everyone loves comic. Even this day and age, kids oh, yeah. love comic. Comics will never die. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, a buddy of mine who's still a friend of mine and i haven't seen him in a while but we're friends on facebook and he's he's a cool dude another musician you know they, they all are and and uh bobby carlton his father owned the comic book store downtown it was uh, it was uh bob, i think it was called bob's news or something like that, or bob's newsstand or something like that <laughs> bob carlton and uh yeah so that's you know the, we'd ride i'd ride but ride my bike downtown go and pick up the, the latest uh I always loved Marvel as far as, I mean, I like DC too, yeah. but Marvel was kind of like my thing because I loved those cartoons that Stan Lee would narrate. So I, I love the Fantastic Four and I'd tune in on Saturday mornings and watch a, what, you know, they'd have like half an hour of Marvel com cartoons, like they would yeah. like five minutes a piece. So they would just kind of show them in a row and they'd be introduced by Stan Lee. Hello, this is Stan Lee. The yeah. last time we saw our heroes, they were on a planet. You know what I mean? And just that that voice, right. that iconic voice. And I don't know who he was at the time. I'm like a little kid, but it's just this great New York voice coming on, going, "It's Stan Lee." Yeah, you know, it yeah, awesome. it was great. And I liked his cameos and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was always cool. So good. Right. So how about you, Kilo? I think Chris's answer is hilarious. He would go to church and then get comics about guys on fire. I mean, it kind of matches, right? <laughs> and, I, and funny. Funny thing is, my character is someone also on fire. So my answer, and the only answer really of like 
I have collected like the first hundred of this comic series um, is Spawn, which is not DC or Marvel. It's made by Todd McFarlane and his company. But Spawn was always my favorite superhero. I bought first. I have the first 20. I have two copies of the first 20. And then the first 100, I have one copy of. And it's just, I don't know. It's something about that, like, Religion makes a good story. You know, religion is the best form of storytelling, in my opinion. Don't hate me, everybody that's watching. So it's like when that religious element is added into a superhero, it just adds more like real life, like imagination to it, stuff that we can kind of pretend that we actually believe it's real. Right. So, right. Yeah. And so Spawn, that's the deal. Spawn dies, goes to hell. Right. And then the devil says, go back up there and, uh, you know, cause some mayhem. And, right. he says, and instead he's like, no, I'm not going to, I'm going to be a good guy. Well, he says he's going to do it, but he knows deep down he's like, fuck you. I'm going to go back and fuck shit up. So, I mean, <laughs> right there's our first F-bomb for the show, I think. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, made it sorry. through one episode. Without <laughs> <fucking going. laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. Spawn is another guy on fire. So, that's my Yeah, episode. there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Right on. Well, hey, you know, if, if people are watching when they see this, uh, make sure you remember uh, chriswise.com and I'll give you a little taste of what I'm up yeah. to. There's little samples up there. There's little video teasers and uh, little audio teasers. And where do you see the artwork? It's, it's, and we'll it's have the link to his website on the page. Right. Somewhere yep. when you're watching or listening to this, you've heard him say it a few times, but you'll see a link somewhere in the video. Yeah, um, so Chris, this is don't forget, it. Chris has to ask a question. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to ask us a question, and then you have to answer it's a question you have to answer yourself as well. So yeah. I have to answer a question again. Okay, well, you yeah. have to ask you a question, ask ask a question yeah. that you want us to answer that you're willing to answer. Uh okay. Uh, and then you're out of the hot seat. Yeah, then you're <laughs> done. <Excellent. laughs> then game over. Do you guys get stuck on puppy videos yeah. on Instagram? Yeah. That's easy. That's there. Yes. <laughs> oh, mine, is, mine is all the way yes. I love those ones that are like bark at your dog. And it's like you bark at the dog and then it's like, what does the dog do back? I try that with my dog and he looked at me like, you're not a dog, so go fuck yourself. I'm like, you're no fun. I can't videotape that. So what about you, Bob? Do you love the puppy videos? Well, you know, I'm uh I'm just so severely ADHD wacko that like, you know, once I once I turn anything YouTube. Right. And I just YouTube comes up and then right. and it's just evil because like you watch any you watch a dog video, right. a video, watch a, you know, yeah, they, they a hot girl you. or a they guitar you, player like, or whatever. Oh my God, yeah. That. You're just suddenly you're just like you know, <laughs> three hours later. You're like, oh, there's another you know, there's okay. a, another puppy. I'm there's glad other girl. grown men do this, too, <laughs> yeah, because I was wondering as a deep, oh, yeah. deep seated <laughs> question I had. I actually have been holding that the whole time. <laughs> That's and, and as uh, Bob just mentioned, YouTube, if you're watching this and you enjoy our content, please like and subscribe to this. So that yes, you please subscribe. You can see our next episodes because if you don't, then the YouTube algorithm won't show you our stupid shit. Right and on. we do fun stuff. Is there anything else you want to say, Chris? That's what we always do at the very end of the show. We say anything you want to say, whether it's a random quote, a stupid thing, a fun thing, whatever. Anything you want to say before we go? No, I'm just real grateful for what it is I've been doing this whole time. I think it's a, uh, I'm just happy I'm doing it. So people are interested and they're entertained yeah. and enjoying all the different albums I've done over the years. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping they're going to even be more entertained by some of my, my new stuff. So sure. um, yeah, just enjoying uh the fact that I can do this and share it with everyone, and I'll announce my uh, acoustic show soon. Right, awesome. and, and I can tell you, as someone who has uh, witnessed, Chris, he had watched Chris's story from the beginning, and it, it has been uh, a, a, a real pleasure to watch and, and to thank be, you, yeah. and even just be tangentially a part of. So, and and I really appreciate you coming and doing this. Yeah, I was going to say that. I pleasure. wanted to say thank you for being part of this experience and giving a little bit of a more rocker outlook to the whole industry and stuff. We haven't had a rocker on That's here. That's true, yeah. We've just done like All EDM stars. artists. We've had EDM artists. We've had a rapper, I think. We've had people that the work in Hollywood. Yeah. So it's great having your 
And you have a very similar outlook to many of the other people we've had on here. It didn't change much. You know, it, sometimes you think maybe because it's a different art form, it's going to be super different and strange. And it's not. It's still pure art and pure inspiration for inspiration's sake. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's what I was saying earlier about like it's all all music is kind of equal to me personally. I mean, if someone loves classical and they can't compare it yeah. to rock, of course, but to me, I kind of hear everything is like, you know, a, a source of inspiration potentially, even country, which I was never into. I kind of enjoying country lately. And uh, yeah, that's it. Keep that passion going. It doesn't matter where it comes from. There's no, it, there's no bad. No, but it's, a, there's only two kinds of music, good music and bad. Music. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks right. for talking uh, today, guys. I enjoyed it a lot. Right on. Thanks, right on. Thanks, thanks, thanks Rock, Kilo. Chris. Kilo, rock on, buddy. I'll be talking yeah, to you guys. later. All right. Adios, everybody. Cold in New York here. <laughs> yeah. Hey, let's take a minute. Hey, I'm just over here.